if you're on church council, the meeting, if you remember, has been moved up a week. So the council meeting is next week. On the 13th is the fall festival out of the farm. That starts uh, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So please keep that in mind. From God's... Uh, back up a little bit. Uh, the offering, uh, we do not take an offering here, but there is a box down at the, the uh, Welcome Center where you can put your tithes and offerings. And uh, from God's word this morning, Psalm 66, verse 2, he says, Sing honor to the name of the Lord and make his praise be glorious. So let's bow for a word of prayer, please. Father God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you, Father God, for your love, for your grace, for your mercy, for the redemption and the forgiveness of sin that is ours in Christ Jesus. I just pray this morning, Father God, that your spirit would flow through here like a tidal wave. Just touch each one that is here, Father. Help each one of us just connect with you in a way that we never have before. I just thank you, Father. Give you all the glory and praise. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together, folks. There is a river. for a second. Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And God, I know the enemy is doing everything it can to distract us, but my eyes are going to be fixed on you. And I desire to be in your presence, and the only thing that keeps me from it is myself. My mind and my will and my desires and my emotions focus on everything but you. 
God, my affections are the most valuable thing that I own. And I give them to you, God. Because that's what you long for. That's what you created me for. I set aside everything else. And all the saints and angels, they bow before your throne. And all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing. You're worthy. You were worthy of it all. Sing it. You were worthy of it all. For from you are for from you are all things, and to you are all things. Yes, you deserve the glory. You are worthy, God. You are worthy of it
You were worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. Yes, you deserve the glory. Jesus, you were worthy. Like you, God. For from you are all things. To you are all things. You deserve the glory. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. presence today. Speak to our hearts and minds in Jesus' name. You can be seated. We're going to do that last song at the end. Worship team, please don't go anywhere because we're going to be right back up here in about 25, 30 minutes. Don't be, don't be sneaking off and going to get your coffee or whatever you guys do. Jeez. Gaither's like, dude, I had plans. Wait till everybody gets situated here. I'm just waiting. be like, what's up with him today? Well, let me tell you what's up with me. Can you put my title page up there, please? Thanks. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know. You know, as I was, we were worshiping God Really, it's no fun being a, a spiritual person when you're trying to f focus on one thing and God just keeps in your mind. But as we were worshiping God and as we we're preparing for service this morning, God just kept showing me, and not in a judgmental way, you don't understand. I mean, um, when you're a pastor and you're responsible for the spiritual development of people, God shows you things about them. And it's not a judgment thing. And if, if you think that that's a judgment thing, then you're, you're, you're not mature enough to be in that position. Okay? Because God can show me and show you something about somebody not to judge them, but to pray for them, to seek his face to what you could do to help them, to encourage them, to help them grow. And as we were uh, 
preparing this morning and then as we were worshiping, God just kept bringing people to my mind and actions that they are doing as we speak that prove that they are not surrendered to God, but they are only living for themselves. And what's burdening about that is I know the consequences of that. That although they think it's, it's good, although they think it's, it's meeting a need, as a matter of fact, one person told me this morning, um, oh, this is good, we're, we're doing this today and it's really good and, and, and it's really good. And it was like, you know, you ever look at someone when they're telling you something and they're actually lying to themselves and they're repeating their lies so that they can make it sound okay? You ever met somebody, talked to somebody? And that's what they were doing. And I didn't even say anything to them. I was just like, hey, what's going on? And they're like, and they just kept repeating it and repeating it. And I'm just sitting there going. I can't tell you how many times I've listened to that and seen the signs of, of owning your life. Where you own your life. You're responsible for happiness and success. And you have the thermostat on telling you whether you're happy or not. And you're responsible for making sure you adjust it on a normal basis. Um, there's nothing worse and more tiring and more demanding than owning your own happiness in life. You know what I mean? And the results of that end in destruction every time. And so as we were worshiping God, God kept just bringing people and situations to my mind of people who are just living a life not surrendered to God. Thinking that it's gonna work. How many of you guys have ever done that? Live your life for yourself thinking it's going to work. And by the way, can you talk yourself into it being a good idea? How many of you have actually found yourself eliminating people out of your lives so, because they, they told you it was a bad idea? And you only bring other people into your lives that will agree with you or they won't say anything to you. And so you, you change your whole influence of friends to, to make sure it lines up with what you want and the lifestyle that you want to live. There is a way that seems right to a man and in the end it leads to death and destruction. And there is a way that seems right to a woman and in the end it leads to death and destruction. For those of you that are like, those women are like, yeah, man, listen. Um, the Bible says in Romans 12, 1, therefore I urge you, brethren and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is the true and proper worship. You can't offer your body a living sacrifice if you haven't surrendered it. It's impossible. You have to surrender yourself to God. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in our society today. And we're gonna do a little bit of teaching here. I'm gonna play teacher here rather than preacher for a few minutes in my sermon this morning. We're gonna brainstorm, we're gonna put some things in the theoretical board, so to speak. And it's your opportunity to confess your sins out loud in front of this group of people. It's not that big of a group of people today. We got a bunch of church people seeking their own today. Let me turn this on. Somebody got me a clicker, they gave it to me. Yes, it is. The question is, surrender what? I, I, I was searching for something. Sometimes holding on does more damage than letting go. And I would like to tell you that um, when it comes to your life, holding on to it will destroy it. You have to let it go and let God. See, the, the reality of it is, is how many of you guys have some things that you'd like to have in life? 
How many of you are afraid you're not gonna have them? And, and the reality of it is, is for you not to surrender that to God means that you don't trust him. That's the reality. That you trust yourself, your understanding, your ability to accomplish goals way more than you trust God. So the reality of it is that God in your mind is not really God. People who have a hard time surrendering to God, what it means is that God has, that somehow God is not sovereign to them. That they still see themselves and their understanding as equal to God. And how many of you realize what normally it takes for God to prove to you you're mortal? Uh, yeah, something horrible happening to you or the loved ones in your life. Now, listen. I'm just telling you. That's what will happen. Because God loves you and he loves you more than your stuff. He could care less about your stuff. He could actually care less about your physical body. He wants you, your spirit, your soul. That's what he wants. What do we have to surrender to, to give our life to Jesus Christ? We have to surrender our life. Well, that's life, uh, well, what does that mean? We have to give him the opportunity to take our life or to not take our life. When I'm saying take your life, I mean you surrender your life. I mean you surrender your life. I had a friend once who was a pastor, and he wasn't a friend very long. Um, but he said, I said to him, I said, so I had been ministering with him, and I was actually contemplating joining his church and being a part of his leadership team. And I, something was weird about this relationship with this guy and about this guy, and I couldn't figure it out. And so God told me to go over and have this big powwow with him. And I, I went over, I spoke with him for about two to three hours. And in that, in that conversation, God said, ask him this question. And I asked him, I said, so do you think that God would call a young man in his 20s, I was in my 20s at the time, with small children over to the mission field to take him and his family to the mission field and put them in jeopardy on the mission field, like take him over to Iran or, or, he said, absolutely not. God would never do that because of the children. And I went, ah, that's the problem. And so I ended the conversation and politely told him I wouldn't be coming to his church anymore because he didn't understand what, see, your life is not really that important to God. Your soul is. The quality of your life isn't that important to God. It is to you, and if the quality of your life is really important to you, that tells us something about you. What you experience in your life isn't that important to God. God wants, when I say the most powerful thing you have in your possession is your affections, I don't, I'm not joking, that goes really deep, folks. God only wants your affections, nothing else you have is worth anything. How many people have been around church people? Anybody ever been around church people? Okay, anybody been around self-righteous church people? I, it's just so funny when they get all butthurt about making a mistake in their life. And because, because it means I'm a certain kind of person. No, it means you're, a sinner, and you, it means you need a savior. And, and it doesn't, if it starts to mean something about you, then, then Christ is of no value to you because Christ died for the sinners and you don't wanna be a sinner no more. The real problem is, is that they took their eyes off of giving affection to God and started putting it upon themselves and their value. They took their affections and instead of giving it to God and seeking after him and seeking to be in his presence, they started putting their affections on all the stupid little things in their life. I'll testify for Joe. 
Joe's that kind of guy. Joe's a, a, an adult male squishy. <laughs> Joe, everything has to be a certain way. And Joe lives in a program with a bunch of drug addicts. And Joe's a drug addict, recovering drug addict. But, but Joe's a, he, Joe uses drugs for selfish, I deserve a feeling kind of thing. And, and everything has to be a certain way. And, and most drug addicts today, they're like, oh, who cares, right? And so Joe's like, these people drive me crazy. And, and Joe came to the realization that God put Joe in this situation so that God could strip that from him. Strip what? It's got to be a certain way. And the most dangerous thing that could happen to Joe is when he gets out of this program, he goes back to living in his own little world where he can be in charge of everything and make everything a certain way because he'll draw strength from it, won't you, Joe? And how many of you guys have ever thought the reason you are successful is because of what you did? Well, hold on a second. Keep your hands up, everybody. Way to go, way to go. Nice job, nice job. And the Bible says that if you get your reward openly in front of others, that's all you get. So enjoy that. Enjoy that attaboy. Yeah. See, how many of you guys have ever taken your eyes off of the God that you say you love and you put it on how you love him? Listen, folks, there's, there's a reason there's 50 plus churches in Marion. It's because people have taken their eyes off of the God they said they love and they focus it on how they're loving God and they drew value and strength from how they loved God. And that means they hadn't surrendered. Sermons like this are really hard to preach. Not just because they're, God brings things up in your mind and heart when you're preaching it, but you, he also shows you the people in the room and he shows you the arrow that hit their heart. Just understand, I'm sharing this with you because I'm tired of watching people be robbed. I'm tired of watching people run around trying to, how do I say, pump themselves up in the Lord. Pump themselves up in their physical or experiences so they can feel like they have joy. Until, the, until it all comes crashing down and reality sets in. I'm tired of it. Because if you don't surrender, that's what you'll do. You'll either crash or you'll pump yourself up and act like everything's okay. And you'll draw straight and you'll, all these little things will mean something to you because it's what's propping you up. Listen, someone who's surrendered doesn't need propped up. I want you to think about this. Imagine you being strapped to a cross and uh, nails shoved through your appendages and someone take a sword and shove it through your side and you're sitting up there and someone comes by and encourages you and says, it's okay, Kim, it's okay. No, it's not. Just know we love you. What good is that? If you loved me, you'd get me down off this thing. You're like, whoa, Pastor Mike, what are you trying to say? What I'm trying to say is, why does it matter to a surrendered person? Pick an appendage, any appendage. Shove the nail through my head. It doesn't matter. How much pain I'm going through, it doesn't matter. Why? Because I've surrendered it. How I feel doesn't matter. 
What I want, oh, that really doesn't matter. What I deserve, <laughs> it doesn't matter when you're surrendered. See, Jesus was surrendered. And so, of all the people that didn't have to bear the cross, of all the people that didn't have to stay up on that thing, he did. Because he was surrendered. And whatever the Father wanted him to go through, that's what he would do. Because his strength came from his Father, not from his life. So I have to surrender my life, my hopes and dreams, my ideas of what, my ideas of what happiness is, my understanding and my future. I have to surrender it all and give it to God. How many of you would be Isaac and just walk up there with Abraham and get ready to lay down on the altar? How many of you would do that? I would. Listen, if you aren't willing to do that, then you're not really a Christian. No wonder you're not experiencing the good things of God. Whew. Listen, I understand. This sermon is for about one of you in the room. One to five percent of all the people that are ever going to listen to this sermon, it's for you. The rest of you, you're going to argue with me. You're going to have mental gymnastics with what I'm saying. You're going to resist what I'm saying. You're going to rationalize your behavior. You're going to rationalize your thought process because you're not surrendered. But there is someone that's listening to me, whether it's on the internet or wherever, or sitting here today. You're, go you're listening to me, and this is going to go, oh, wow. And you're going to change. And I'm sorry that the rest of you have to set through this. I am. But somebody in this room is going to finally lay it down. You're going to finally lay it down. And you're going to say, oh well. Surrender to God equals death to self-centeredness. Oh, we're going deep. <laughs> Surrender to God means death to self-centeredness. I ask myself continually, this is me, I ask myself continually, what can I do to help people understand the peace, freedom, and joy of surrendering to God? What I have come to understand is as Americans, we have built on the sinful spiritual stronghold in each of us of self-centeredness. It entered into Adam and Eve in the garden where they desired to be more than what God said they should be. And now we have built upon it in America. We build upon the spiritual stronghold of self-centeredness even to the point that now the church is carrying the water for the sin of self-centeredness. Self-centeredness defined as my life has, given, has been given to me for me. It is my right to experience and enjoy as much as I can while I live out my life because experience and self-defined success is what life is about. Boy, that's what we teach. When you step back and look at our world from a, from a 10,000 feet, you look at people going into debt, $250,000 so they can make 10% more than someone who doesn't. That doesn't even make sense. But why? Because the world has taught people, hey, if you go to college and get a degree, you'll be somebody. We're putting people into bondage who don't even want to do the things that they're going to pay to do. <laughs> they don't want to do those things and we just, because they convince them that you can be someone. You'll never experience all that God has for you or your life or the purpose of life in your life if you don't become somebody. We sell it to them over and over again. From the time they're little kids, we sell them the idea of being someone.
Okay. Just take a picture of it. Listen. Our world, man, this is what we live for. This is what we live for. This is what we live for, isn't it? Life. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button. No, I'm in control and I'm just going crazy. Life has been given to me for me. It is my right to experience and enjoy as much as I can while I live out my life. Because experience and self-defined success is what life is about. And we've even gotten to the point in America today where you're allowed to define success any way you want and if someone comes against what you think success is, they're evil. So if success to you means living in a house with 200 cats and you can't walk through the house because there's so much cat urine and, and feces and, and if you walk, no one's allowed to say anything to you about that because that's your life and you're allowed to define your life success. Yeah. It's insane, isn't it? I could go to even some more hot button things, but I don't want to offend anybody in the room past the point of you stopping to listen to me. So I won't do it, but we could. I don't want to get you distracted with your own ideas of what right and wrong are. The church is the main teacher of this self-idolatry. We have created a God who is preoccupied with what we are experiencing. God is in heaven and he's worried about you and worried about whether you're happy or not. Don't you understand? Some of you know what, some of you have listened to it. Have, how many of you have listened to it and you're sitting there going, what, what is this person talking? Has he even read the Bible at all? We encourage people to study the word so they can live a good life and position themselves in a way to receive more blessings. So studying the word and reading the Bible is all about your quality of life. It's not about knowing God. It's all about being the best Christian you can be so you can position yourself and use the God machine to get the things that you want to get. How many of you guys have ever seen, I, I was gonna put some pictures of people surrendering in the military. How many of you have ever seen people surrender in the military? Do they barter? No. What do they do? They put their guns down, they come out, and they throw themselves at the mercy of the people they're surrendering to. And those people in the history of mankind, many times line them up and shoot them in the head and bury them in a trench. Americans, we don't do that. They surrender to us and we give them food and water and we make them beds and put tents up so they have a place to live and we make sure we buy the right kinds of uh, material so they can feel good about their, their spirituality. And I mean, we're like, you know, well, we're really sorry we, you had to surrender to us. It's just, you know, but we just had to do it, you know. We don't even understand what surrender means, right? Just don't understand. <laughs> We're so smart, us humans, right? We have begun to try to recreate even nature. Like, animals shouldn't eat animals. You think I'm joking, I'm not joking. Listen, listen, listen to me. 
Um, there's a lot of studies out about this, but um, the danger of large cities isn't that it's a big group of people together. The danger of large cities is they remove themselves so much from nature that nothing that they interact with is natural, okay? The trees were put there on purpose, okay? Uh, we eradicate all the animals we don't want to have in that, in that community. You guys hear me? If we have mice, we go after and we kill all the mice. If we have rats, we kill all the rats. If we have homeless people, we get them somewhere and ship them off somewhere else, okay? We, we kill all the weeds. There's no weeds. We, if, the, if we can't kill it, we'll concrete it. We, no building should be left unair conditioned, amen? Um, but it's, it's that, that we, we create this environment where we are the gods and the controllers of the environment. And then what happens is hundreds, thousands, and millions of people are raised from babes, never experiencing nature. Listen. Hundreds, thousands, and millions of people are raised never knowing that nature is more powerful than man. People like me, I grew up on a farm out in the middle of nowhere. I look at people who are like, we're killing our earth. And I look at them and go, are you stupid? Yes, here's the thing, they are. And the reason they're stupid and ignorant is because they've never experienced nature. What you think about this? A couple of years ago, there's something happened, and there was a little a sea lion that had gotten oil all over it, and it was sick or something, and they, they captured it, and they, they, they nursed it back to health, and, and then they let it go. And they were all out there. There's like 50 to 100 people out there going, yay, the little sea lion's out there. And so the little sea lion swims out there and a big whale comes by and eats it. Ah. It was just absolutely hilarious. It was all these stupid, ignorant people who were like, we're in charge of society and nature. We're in charge. And God was like, no, you're not. Watch this. <laughs> Free willing, right? <laughs> And you just, you just sit there and go, and, and, and these people were mortified and I'm sure they wanted to try to kill all the whales, but wait, we can't kill the whales. Listen, it don't matter. Listen I live down by, I'm, I live a half mile from the river, right? And I have a creek that goes up the back of my property and, and so I have all kinds of wildlife that go around my property and, and I can't keep chickens if I had to. As a matter of fact, I had chickens one, a couple years ago my wife and I, we love chickens. We love fresh eggs, you know. And so we got a barn, so there's no cost to us other than feeding them, right? And, and so we had these chickens, and I built this spot in the barn. And, and I spent probably hours and hours putting cage around it, up over it. So nothing could get in there, right? Doesn't matter, dude. We had a mink dig a hole this big, this deep, down underneath, everything I put in, and got in there and butchered every one of those chickens. I mean, it butchered. We went out there one morning, we're like, oh. <laughs> I mean, there's chicken pieces everywhere. Feathers everywhere. Just carcasses of chickens laying there, just the bones that were like picked clean. And I'm just going, I guess I'm not in charge, huh? <laughs> See, us people that grew up on the farm, we know that nature is nature. And you know, if I have a field, and I take that field and I, and I decide to blacktop it, put some gravel down and blacktop it, and put the blacktop down, 
If I don't take care of that field, Mike, what's going to happen to it? Nature's going to swallow that field back. It will take it back. What do you mean it will take it back? Just watch what happens. Within a couple of years, there'll be grass growing in my parking lot. Within 10 years, there'll be big sim- uh, big separations in the, in, the con- in the pavement. And there'll be big trees and weeds growing out of it. Mike calls it grass fault. It'll be grass fault. And once it becomes grass fault, then shortly after that it becomes, uh, you know, like yeah, tree fault. I mean, it's insane. This is the danger we have in America. We've actually elevated ourselves to where we're the smartest people. We know so much more than everybody else, period. It's scary. It is self-idolatry. We now define right and wrong. We now define good and bad for us. We define it. We define what happiness looks like. And the church carries the water for Satan. Our focus in teaching our young church leaders is not how to serve and be a well living, uh, be a well of living water that never runs dry, but we prepare them to make sure they are not burning themselves out and being taken care of, making sure they're being taken care of. That's what we teach our young leaders in, in seminaries and, and Bible college. But the Bible tells us that we're supposed to be teaching people to be a living wa- well of living water springing out forever and eternity. How could God's living water run out? How could his living water burn out? But God forbid we teach our young leaders, why, well, why don't we teach them that? Because we've decided what healthy lifestyle looks like. Oh. We have decided what a mental health looks like. Some of, some of you are not aware of what our society does to indoctrinate people into self-idolatry. But unfortunately, I work with people in the trenches. You can too if you'd like, but you have to get rid of yourself. Because you won't be able to handle it very long. But I get to work with people who are knee deep into society's reprogramming of, of reality. And they tell me things. And I'm just like, no, that didn't happen. And then they'll bring me their, their paperwork. They'll bring me their worksheets. They'll bring me their books. And I'll, I'll be like, there's no way in the world we're teaching this to people. It's putting them in complete bondage. And Satan's going, that's right. Self-centeredness and self-idolatry brings nothing but bondage. Can anybody tell me why? Well, the first thing is it's not about God, right? The first thing is it's, it's not focused on God and God created the heavens and the earth and God created how it's supposed to work, right? But the second reason it's nothing but bondage is that we teach people that they are the determiners of truth for themselves. That you decide how you feel is a determiner of whether things are going good or not. How you feel and what you feel you're experiencing is what matters. And if you're experiencing or feeling a certain way that you don't like, then there's an injustice somewhere and somebody should do something about it. <laughs> I've been saying that for about five years and people look at me like, listen, there's an injustice. I don't, I'm not happy. Someone is doing me wrong. Somebody should be responsible for me being happy. (laughs) 
You don't think that we're, we're, we're teaching people that? Well, let me ask you this question. When you go to the doctor, they ask you how you feel. Do they ask you if you feel safe? Do you feel depressed? My doctor doesn't dare ask me that anymore. I'll look at him and say, it's none of your business. I'm here because I have a cough. Ask me another question like that and we're out of here. And I'm writing you up and I'm calling your boss. What are you trying to come on to me or something, you weirdo? It's none of your business. You laugh, but some of you, how many of you guys were raised in a time when people ask you that? It was weird, right? What are you asking me how I feel if I feel safe at home? I look at them like, no, I have six daughters. Would you feel safe at home? God. We live in a world where we can go to the doctor's office and the first thing they do is ask us to define whether we're happy or not. And if we're not, it is their duty, their Hippocratic oath or hypocr hypocritical oath, um, to fix that problem, to fix your unhappiness. Listen, folks. The church is right there. The church doesn't teach people to rejoice in our sufferings as we prepare to experience God's glory. As a matter of fact, most people who go to church are ashamed to share their sufferings with their church family for fear they will be judged as a non-spiritual person because they are not living the blessed life. Whew. I can't go to church and tell those people what just happened. Well, why not? That's what the church is for. They'll, what will they think of me? Right, who cares? Why, I thought you surrendered. We really believe that God is in heaven and his number one concern is the quality of our emotional experience. How many of my, my wife's fable, favorite Bible verse is, God is in heaven and, and he does as he pleases. And there is no reference to his dis concern for you. He does as he pleases. He doesn't take a poll. He doesn't have a, uh, you know, he doesn't take a snap poll on the internet. He doesn't send his spirit down to check what everybody wants. doesn't send us tweets. He just does what he wants to do because he's God. And we're not. Matthew 26, 39. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, this is Jesus, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me yet, not as I will, but as you will. That takes surrender. Not everyone who says to be Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. I love people. I love the religious Nazis who read this. Because they immediately take this and go, see, you're not going to heaven because you didn't do what God told you to do. And you're not going to heaven because you didn't do what God told you to do. And you, you got angry at that person who cut you off on the highway, and therefore you have sinned. Totally not understanding the concept of what this Bible verse is talking about at all. Can you keep all the rules and not do the will of the Father? Absolutely. Absolutely. Doing, caring about the will of the Father has nothing to do with rules. Mm. 
See, I like to say it like this. God doesn't care about how you get there. He just cares that you're trying to get there. The, when you start caring about how you get there, you now are focused on the quality of your experience. Whew. I might get to the top of the hill where God's at, and I might be dragging myself with one arm left. Just one arm, my legs cut off, my other arms cut off. Just dragging myself with one arm, but I'm still dragging myself. Listen, <laughs> I can't tell you how many people standing at the bottom of the hill going to me, looking at me going, when my leg gets cut off, they look at me and go, I told you, look at me, I'm perfect health. I told you not to do that. I told you it was dangerous. Well, well, you don't understand. My experience is not what matters here. Being with God was what matters, and he's on the top of the hill. So I'm going to go up that mountain no matter what. It's like you're talking to somebody from another planet. Yeah, but what about this, and what, what about that? Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Here he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Wow. Are you running after God? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all the other things. And the other things he was referring to is where am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? How, where am I going to work? How am I going to do this? All those other things will be added unto you. How many of you guys have ever been preoccupied with those other things? Satan is working in your life. Anybody in the room ever been preoccupied with what other people think of you as you're doing those other things? Satan is working in your life. And he is in control, not God. You have submitted yourself to Satan. So don't you say that about me. Well, that's true. Would you like me to lie to you? I can lie to you. You know what? This is a lie. You know what? God just looks down from heaven, Sarah, and he sees you and he sees your pain. And he just sent me here today to tell you that he loves you, sweetie, and he doesn't want you to go through any pain. Lie, 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 lie. Well, God loves you, Sarah. God loves you. But you don't get to take part in his glory if you don't take part in his suffering. That's actually scriptural. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Have you ever ministered to somebody for a long time? What are you going to do when they go through pain? Because we all do. The only, the, the natural thing, if we preach and teach this false sense of idolatry, is that you did something wrong. That you must not have followed the ways of the master. Because if you follow the ways of the if you follow the ways of the master. <laughs> if you follow the ways of the master, then everything will be right. And peace will be upon you. Except the Bible doesn't say that. You know what it does, Pastor Mike? It says it'll make your path straight. How did you get straight into comfort and ease? How did you turn straight into comfort and ease? I mean, what kind of mental, spiritual, theological gymnastics do you have to do to turn, make your path straight into comfort and ease and everything's going to be fine? It doesn't make any sense. 
If the Son of Man, if God himself came down in the form of a, of a human and he had to suffer, would he suffer so I didn't have to? No. He suffered so that when I suffer, it matters. Jeremiah 10, 23, and 25. I actually stumbled on this today, and I actually really liked it. Lord, I know that I know that people's lives are not their own. It is not for them to direct their steps. Discipline me, Lord, but only in due measure, not in your anger, or you will reduce me to nothing. <laughs> That's a good one right there, buddy. Woo! That's like, yeah! He knows. He I could go on and on and on about people in the, in the church teaching people to be idolaters of self-centeredness. And I could go on and on and on about how the Bible shows us not to do that. So how do we have this disconnect? Because we've, idol we've made ourselves gods. So let me ask, before we go to here, I wanna ask you this question. If we didn't live in a world where we were the sovereign keepers of facts and knowledge and understanding, and, we've, and we really did, which we haven't, by the way, we really did think that the world is going to burn it, itself into oblivion because of our carbon footprints. Wouldn't we be repenting and turning and asking God to save us? No, we don't wanna do that. We wanna give a central power more authority to tax us because the central authority and power knows best. And by the way, we have no proof it happens. We have no proof that climate change happens. And we definitely don't have, well, we know it happens, but we don't know why. So what are we doing? Going off our own understanding. Right? Let's answer my first question here. What can I do to help people understand the peace, freedom, and joy of surrendering to God? And the answer is, do it. Do it. What did Jesus do to help us understand? He did it. Yeah, and what was the example of? Loving someone more than himself, loving others, more than himself. The biggest example he was, was surrender. I tell people all the time, it's easy to surrender when you have nothing to surrender. And we look at Jesus and we're like, he had nothing. Oh, really? Listen, Satan didn't take him up on the mountain because he had nothing. Satan didn't take him up on the mountain to tempt him because he had nothing and he could do nothing. Satan didn't tell him to cast himself down from the tops of the temple because he couldn't do anything. Satan didn't look at him and say, make that rock into bread because he couldn't make it into bread. Jesus could have done anything he wanted. Jesus was the most powerful, most influential creature we've ever imagined in the history of our times because he's God. And yet he surrendered to the point of brutal suffering on the cross. Mm. He was the best example of surrender we could imagine. And even in the scriptures it says, if we take part in his sufferings, we will take part in his glory. If we don't, we won't. 
Now I'm gonna say something to you that's gonna be a little bit astounding. But it's true. How many wonder, like, Pastor Mark, if all these churches are teaching self-centeredness and idolatry, why are they so full? Because it works. Because it works. What do you mean it works? They're getting exactly what they're buying. What do you mean? They're going in there. They're idolaters. They're seeking an emotional experience. And what are they getting? An emotional experience for a season. There's, there's truth there, folks. I mean, it's, it's truth for sinners. It's truth for people who are lost, but there's truth. Have you ever ran into somebody that went to a church like that and they were like, you know, as I grew in the Lord, I just was like, I needed something more. Anybody ever talk, talk to people like that? Yeah. You're like, I just, you know, it was an emotional experience, but it was like, that's it? My wife went to a church like that up in uh, Michigan. Very influential, very powerful, very, uh, and it was just, and she looked at him and was like, so, I gave my life to Jesus Christ and you're telling me that that means come to church on Sunday and go to small group on Sunday night. That's it? And then I'm supposed to live my life. And she, she, she'll share it with you. She goes, I looked at the lady that led me to Christ. I was like, there's got to be more than that. I mean, I, I gave up my whole lifestyle to serve God. And you're telling me I need to just go to my small young adult group on Sunday night and come to church on Sunday morning and shazam, the rest of my life I just live for myself, just do a little better job at it. And God will bless you. You know, If you take these principles, God will bless you in your life. And you, you look at the leadership of the church, they don't talk about their suffering, they don't talk about what they're going through, they don't talk, they, they can't because people want, they want to feel encouraged. Right? People want to be encouraged on Sunday morning, Pastor Mike, they don't want to be told they need to suffer. They don't want to be told that they're lying, self-centered jerks who are just lying to themselves. Nobody's gonna come back here, Pastor Mike. I don't want you back here if you're like that. You just get in the way, man. You're like a cancer. You can come back if you'll say you're wrong. If you'll repent from your wicked ways. How many of you realize that, so what you're saying, Pastor Mike, is I need to just Die to myself and get up on my cross. Well, it's funny because the Bible says, take up your cross and follow me. Yeah, not just once, not just when you got saved, but every day. Paul says, I die daily. I beat myself into submission. Why does he have to beat himself into submission? Anybody ever, anybody ever get up on the cross? Does your flesh go, no! Nah! I mean, the concept of denying your flesh. Oh, oh. Pastor Mike, I don't want to deny my flesh. I just want God to wash it clean. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You guys, are, you understand what I'm saying? I don't want to deny it. I just want to wash it clean. Oh. Whatever you sow, you'll reap. If you sow in the flesh, you'll reap in the flesh. If you sow in the spirit, you'll reap in the spirit. I'm not gonna argue with you about your salvation. Show me your fruit. 
Come on, show it. Mm. We got none. Right. What might surrendering and displaying it to those God has around me look like? So let's do this little brainstorming. What does surrendering to God and suffering and displaying that to those around me, what does that look like? What's it look like? What's it look like for you? First of all, you have to be willing to be open. You have to be willing to look a fool. You ever seen Shaq and the Fool? God, I love that show. Some of you are like, what is that? It's Shaq watches the NBA, Shaquille O'Neal. And he, he takes clips of all the stupid people and when they acted stupid and he gives them awards. Shaq and the Fool. Shaq and a fool. And it's just hilarious. You have to be willing to be on Shaq and a fool. Because every time you get out there, there's a possibility you're going to make a mistake. Every time you get out there, there's a huge possibility you're going to make a fool of yourself. So you got to be willing to be on his show. You can't do that if your quality of life is the most important thing you're living for. Because it might make me feel bad about myself. It might make me feel inadequate. People are laughing at me, Pastor Mike. People don't like me. They're mean to me. People just don't appreciate what I do. <laughs> You're right. They don't. Why do you care? Mm. Can you imagine Jesus going, Father, I just can't do this. These people don't appreciate what I'm doing here. They just don't appreciate everything I'm trying to do for them. Get me down off this thing. I'm signing myself out. I want my keys. Could you imagine that? Can you imagine giving, giving yourself completely everything you have, setting up there on the cross, butt naked, right? Butt naked, not buck, butt. Butt naked, up on the cross, and then receiving all the sin and shame that's ever been on the history of mankind and ever will be, it just gets placed in your spirit. <sighs> Ain't nobody really appreciate that. We can't even comprehend that. You can't even stand to bear your own shame. You can't even stand to, to accept and bear the consequences of your own negative behavior. No long take on somebody else's. I love the fact that Jesus was like, not my will, but yours be done. Why did he do that? I love the fact that he did that because it showed me he was a man. What was his mental, oh, listen, I, I gotta ask you guys, there, there's somebody we need to pray for. 
Okay, somebody that God has set them free and they are, are being deceived right now. They're not here. God has set them free and they are being deceived as we speak. Okay? Deceived by what we're talking about. Self-idolatry, self-centeredness, using God and religion to benefit yourself and how God wants to bless you and how God wants to do this for you and how God's going to do this and how God's going to do that. Pray for them. Let's pray. God, I just ask you to deliver them, protect their heart and mind, and I ask you to do whatever you need to do to the person speaking to them. Let your will be done in the name of Jesus. Listen, it's, this, is, this is what happens. The church is being used by Satan himself to lull the people of God to sleep. It happened from the history of mankind. It has always happened. We start feeling important. We want a sense of identity from our relationship with God instead of, I just need God. I don't need a sense of identity from my relationship with God. I just need God. Amen. I don't need him to appreciate me. The fact that he still puts up with me is enough. Amen. I'm preaching now, aren't I? Woo. And let me explain this to you. Me displaying that ridiculousness in public is extremely valuable. What do you mean? Listen, Jesus didn't sin. But at the end of his life, at the culmination of his purpose, everyone saw him. Bearing all sin. What? He didn't sin. But the, at the culmination of his purpose on earth, God poured out all the sin. Do you not understand what sacrifice is? When they took a goat and they cut its throat and took the blood, it was to cover the sin of the person who brought the goat. When Jesus was dying, his blood being shed was to cover all the sin. And theoretically, all the sin gets placed upon the beast. Jesus, who was God and is God. Think about that. Put himself in a place where he had to stand and display with every sin. And you're afraid? To put yourself out there and be embarrassed? You don't want people to see your struggles? That's the whole point of this process. You, you want to show people what surrender looks like? Become, now listen, someone's goat. If you can't be your own goat, you'll never be someone else's. No greater love can someone have than to lay down their life for their friend. To display your surrender to God, you put yourself out there. Sin 
and all. Here I am. Yeah, that's my, I'm not good at that. I suck at that, yep. That's my struggle, man, getting my business when you see me acting like that. And then you just go on. Climbing that hill to where God is. And people point out your problems. You look at them and go, yep, pray for me. And God will receive glory out of your surrendered life. And he will reveal himself to those watching. I want to say this. My, my question is, what do I need to do to show people the value of surrender? And you might say, well, Pastor Mike, why are you asking that question? Because I'm tired of people experiencing it for a season only till God brings them up here. They were here and God brings them up here. And then they've got it from here. And you know what normally happens? They come back to me down here again. And they don't understand what happened. And I just look at them and go, what are you doing? You didn't stay surrendered. See, it's easy to be surrendered when you ain't got nothing. I surrender everything I've got to Jesus. What do you have? Uh, three sets of clothes. Poor Christian came in with no clothes and about $30,000 worth of debt. It's easy to be surrendered to God, right? I surrender all. What's all? Nothing. But it's when God sets them up on the rock and he starts building them back up. I surrender all means something very different at that point. Well, I got things, uh, uh, well, I could, I could, uh, uh, I don't want to do that. I always say, when you got choices, then we'll find out who you are. We had that happen this week. We had somebody come in the program, they thought they didn't have any choice. As soon as they thought there was a glimmer of hope, of choice down there, their whole attitude, demeanor was like, it was like, oh, look at that. What'd you, there it is. Look at that. There it is. Oop, there it is. Can you surrender to God to the point that he can raise you up on a rock so you can suffer? Why would he make me suffer? So he can show his glory. Well, I don't want to suffer. Well, you're in the wrong place. There's a couple churches I could send you to. They don't teach suffering. They teach, well, they do talk about it and how God will help you and how they'll pray for you. Remember last week we talked about seasons, right? I told you to embrace it. Ooh, I see suffering coming. And that's how people are gonna see God through your life. Listen, listen. Years and years ago, you ever study the history of church in America? You ever notice that a bunch of, of these old churches were all built about the same time? You ever notice that? And you're like, well, what was going on then? Well, there was a great revival prior to that. And God moved and brought a bunch of people into the church. And so they had a bunch of money. And what they decided to do was build buildings to display the glory of God. 
That's why they're coffins now. We don't build buildings to display God's glory. I mean, think about that statement and what we're talking about. Well, that's like the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. Uh huh. But somehow, somewhere in that season in America, Satan deceived everybody into thinking that the glory of God would be displayed by the blessings that God gave you. Wow, isn't that funny that that's still what's being taught today? What was the last, remember, you guys remember the last time you went through something really bad where you're living for yourself, you're going to church on and off, you're living for yourself, you went through something really bad, and who did you reach out to? God, why? Because he'll bless me, he'll take care of me, he'll fix my problems. Wow. It goes deep, this goes really deep, folks. It's ingrained in every one of us. The idea that I'm going li- to live my life for God and it's going to be a life of suffering and pain and God will bring blessings. It's not all suffering and pain, but it's not, it's not relevant unless I'm living for me. Wow. What does it look like for you? What is the thing that God put his finger on that you really don't want to give up? Because we like to think of suffering as from without. But listen, (laughs) the mature person understands that there is no suffering from without like that from within. The Bible says, Jesus said, when you fast. Now fasting was all about what? Practicing suffering. Fasting was all about exercising your suffering muscles. (laughs) On purpose. Not because someone else made you, but because you decided I'm gonna exercise my suffering muscles today. There is nothing more painful than hunger. It affects your physical, spiritual, and emotional being. Every part of you suffers. Someone can come by and cut your finger and you'd be like, ouch, right? But if you're hungry, Not just for an hour, but for days. Someone's gonna pay. Folks, listen, I want you to think about this. If you practice suffering, if you exercise your suffering muscles through fasting, the next time you had a headache, you'd be like, whatever. You wouldn't reach for a bottle. Why? Have you ever fasted? Does it include headaches? Huh. Do you have an emotional moment when you're fasting? Yeah. Do you get disoriented a little bit? Yeah, you get disoriented. I want you to think about this. Jesus had a, they had a plan. How many churches talk about fasting? Well, the pastor needs to be fasting so he can uh, prepare for, to give me what I need on Sunday morning. You wanna see what suffering looks like? Fast. Anybody, ever, anybody here ever fasted food and only had water? Raise your hand. You fasted food and only had water. Doesn't matter how long. I mean, not, I'm not talking about because you had a test at the doctor. 
Some of you will fast for the doctor, but you won't fast for God. You'll fast so you can get a diagnosis and get some more medicine, but God forbid you'd fast to, to exercise your suffering muscles. Ooh. I know, folks, people are going to watch this on the internet. They'll, they'll be able to use this for decades to ruin my ministry. Join the club. Serious. Nobody wants to go to a church like that. Good. Make my job easier. <laughs> Listen. You want to practice some suffering? The Bible tells us we're supposed to practice suffering. Last night. I have um, gone through this season in my life where there's physical suffering, but spiritual just pouring out, okay? Physical pouring out of the things of the Spirit, God, fruit, watching people delivered, watching people healed. And so, and I was sitting there last night, I was thinking, I was like, God, I'm not perfect. I'm not good. Why are you doing this for me? Have you ever thought you did everything right and God didn't bless you? Let's, I'm glad he didn't. And it ruined you. What's really awesome is when you don't do everything right and he blesses you and you sit there and go, because God doesn't care about any of those things. And what I felt the Spirit saying to me was, Mike, you're running after God. He doesn't care. God, God doesn't care how I run after God. Just run after him. If you're doing something totally unscriptural, God will deal with you about it. God will send people into your life to mess with you about it. It'll affect your life if you don't deal with it. Remember, you sow to the flesh, you reap to the flesh. But just run after God. He'll take care of all the rest. I don't care what your problem is. I don't care where you're at. Just run after God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He'll take care of the rest. And God started bringing back to my memory all the things that my flesh wants to do and I've given it up. And it didn't come back to my mind of the things I want to do, like, I really want to do. No, it was, remember that dream you had? And you just walked away from it? Remember that? And you don't care about that no more? And what do you, what do you care about? Put my head down and seek after God's will. And then he was like, tell them. Tell them. Listen, stop trying to be super spiritual. Stop it. Run after God. If God tells you to read your Bible, read your Bible. If he tells you to go for a walk, go for a walk. If he tells you to listen to praise and worship music, listen to praise and worship music. Don't let somebody else or your own self define what your spirituality looks like. You want to know what spirituality looks like? Give of yourself suffering to bless others. Then we can call you spiritual. Until you do that, it's a waste of time. All the Bible reading, all the praying, all the fasting, it's all a waste of time. Until you're willing to lay down your self-importance and lay down yourself and put yourself in a place where people can use and abuse you any way they want and you have no power to stop it. I 
I love it when I get the opportunity to stand up for somebody else because I can't stand up for myself. Because okay? I'm scared to stand up for myself. You guys, some of you know why, some of you don't. I'm scared to stand up for myself because then I, don't, I wouldn't be sacrificing, right? I wouldn't be suffering for other people. But sometimes when people are like, and th the other day somebody said, well, she should have done this for us. And I went, Bruh. So I wouldn't stand up for me, right? And I was like, why do you think that she should have done that for you? But that's what we do. Is we put ourselves in a place where people despitefully use us. Listen, if you can't fast, you'll never be able to minister. If you can't inflict pain and suffering on yourself, you will never be able to handle somebody else doing it to you. Let me say it like this. If you can't put yourself in a place of discomfort on purpose to practice getting ready for what God has for you, you will never allow someone to impose discomfort on you. Therefore, you'll never experience suffering. So Joe, when those people drive you crazy about how they take care of things, praise the Lord, there's your opportunity to suffer. Yeah. And when we say, I'm not gonna put up with this anymore, uh-oh. There's our opportunity to sin. There's our opportunity, I'm gonna raise the bar. We're gonna raise the bar right here. Oh, really? Because you're the bar raiser, huh? You're the keeper of the bar. You're the standard bearer. Uh -huh. Now you know how those churches started. Not a joke, is it? I've been a part of church splits over it. I've actually watched it happen. What's it look like for you? What's surrendering? See, if I looked at you and said, today is a day of fast, we're all gonna fast. You'd be like, who does he think he is? Fail. Fail. Why? You're not surrendered to anybody then, are you? I can do my own thing. I don't need him to tell me how to live my life for God. Trust me, I, I'm, I'm planning on leaving here and having chicken wings, so we ain't fasting today, glory to God. <laughs> don't none of you get all worried and be like, oh, Pastor Mike, how dare him. <laughs> I'm ordering and going home. <laughs> What does it look like for you? So I gotta tell you this, and I'm, I'll be done, and you guys can come up here and start playing, otherwise we'll never be done. I gotta tell you this. Listen, listen, listen. I had about seven or eight interactions with people this morning before service, before when I got here. My poor little daughter, she comes to me, Ariana comes up to me and goes, Daddy, can I go with you this morning? And I can't do that. If, if, I, if I have people around me on Sunday morning, I have a really hard time focusing on what God wants me to do, okay? And so I'll, I'm, I have ADHD really bad, so I'll be like, <laughs> right? And so, but I had about eight interactions with people this morning before service. Almost every one of them was people telling me how things in their life were getting in the way of serving God. And how they were succumbing to them or, or giving in to them. And some of them, they didn't even know they were saying it, but they were. How many of you guys have ever used someone else's actions of selfishness as a way to justify your own? Yeah. 
Well, Pastor Mike, I can't do that anymore because I got this going on. And Pastor Mike, I can't do that because I'm doing this. And I don't want to do this anymore because I need this. And Okay. So much for suffering. So much for God-centeredness. Listen, I know this is a dangerous way of thinking in life. But if God tells you to do something, there's no excuse. There's no reason why not to. God's going to drag my dead body off the field if he told me to score a touchdown. I will be there trying to score a touchdown till I'm dead. I never want to be caught somewhere else. Why? Could you imagine Jesus going, I just, sorry guys, but I just need some time. Yeah, I need some me time. The fact that my service to God, and by the way, service to God, he calls you to serve others. I know it really sort of sucks because everybody wants their service to God to be independent of others. You know what I mean? Have you ever met people like that? Well, I could serve God right here in front of my TV. I don't need to be around those church people. Right? Six or eight interactions I had this morning, getting ready for the service, was people telling me how either they weren't going to obey God and do God, the things God told them to do anymore so that they could serve themselves, or someone telling me that someone else had decided to do that. And my heart's broke for all of them. Why? You sow to the flesh, you reap in the flesh. That doesn't change, no matter how well-meaning it is. No matter if it's for your children, for someone else's children. For your state of mind. And you're robbing yourself of God. You won't experience God. Just go to, go to one of those churches, man. It's a, good, it's a good transaction. You need to be encouraged, they'll encourage you for the day. You wanna be encouraged in your selfish lifestyle? Go there, they'll encourage you in your selfish lifestyle. You will feel loved and accepted. You won't experience God, but that's not what you're living for. I'm going to ask you, this is, this is what a surrendered for God lifestyle looks like. Ready? Ready? What did God tell you to do? Is your whole life centered around accomplishing that goal? So you're like, I don't know what God told me to do. Ah, there you go. <laughs> you, have, you don't have a living for God lifestyle. You're not surrendered to God. What did God tell you to do? Have you rearranged your life to do it? Is it causing you suffering? Is your whole life, would, would you, re listen, ready? The only reason you wouldn't be doing what God told you to do when God told you to do it is because you're so sick you can't get out of bed and you probably need to go to the hospital. That's the only reason. There's never a reason outside of that. 
How many of you guys, you make commitments to God, but then you always break them for all these little things that mean something? And it's almost always to self-gratiate yourself. What would happen if we all did that? Sorry, Jesus is on vacation today. Like Pittsburgh, aren't you preparing a vacation in October? Yep, I am. People in my church came to me and said, Pastor Mike, you need to get away with your family. I'm not going on vacation for me. If I, if I was, yeah. So you don't have to listen to me on a Sunday morning. But she's right. I'm going on vacation so I can be a healthier person. I need a break from these two for sure. I'm not taking you, Debbie. Nate, you can come, but not Debbie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your surrender to God lifestyle looks like someone, now listen to what I'm about to say, who is single-minded. Yeah, we all have stuff in our life that has to get done, but it's all getting done to accomplish that goal. It's not getting done so we can have this over here in our life and this over here in our life. Uh-uh. Because me being with God is the only thing that matters and it's all I need. Pastor Mike, that's not very emotionally healthy. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. God tells us, in this word, he tells us to rest. People took time and rested and, and re... But then they went right back at it. If you don't even know what it is here, folks, you're really lost. If you're like, I, I can't tell you what it is. I don't, I'm not even sure. I, you don't even have a relationship with God. Because trust me, if you are sitting on this earth, completely surrendered to God, God would be telling you to do something. If you're like, hey God, I'm right here, man. Whatever you want me to do, just tell me what it is you want me to do and I'll do it. You think God just doesn't hear you? He'll show you. He'll direct you. He'll guide you. But you've got to be willing to make serving him and doing what he told you to do the most important thing. It's lost. Some of you. Some of you are just like, oh, come on, man. Listen. If you're here today and you're like, dude, I totally get this. That's what's been missing in your life. Surrender yourself to God and make what he's telling you to do the most important thing. Stop, listen, don't listen to all the other things that you think you need to do in order to do that. Don't listen to all the people who are telling you, you need to, well, you need to do this and you need to, don't, don't, stop. Stop. No, you don't. That's how Satan works. You don't need to do all, just run after God. He will lead and direct your paths. He will guide you in his ways. Just run after him with all you've got. Let's pray. I'm gonna sing it. You gotta sing it. Let's just take some time and worship the Lord together. Can we do that? And if you're here and you're like, you know what, I'm not surrendered. Take the next few minutes and surrender yourself to God.
be with you, God. I give it all to you. I give it all to you. You're beautiful. There is not worthy to be praised but you. For you love your people. You long to be with them and their spirits. You long for us to be in your presence. we leave, I just want to, God told me to say this to you. If you're wondering if what I'm talking about is real and blah, 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 I'm sorry if you don't understand, but let me share something with you that's very obvious in scripture to help you understand this, to help you understand how dangerous all the, the voices out there are in the church. The Bible says that there is no flesh that will glory in the presence of God. So it's foolish for us to enter into his presence, wanting him to consider our flesh, wanting him to value it, wanting him to bless it, wanting him to encourage us in the flesh. If I'm going to be where God is and I'm going to do what God wants and I'm going to experience all that God has for me and I'm going to surrender myself, that means I surrender everything. And I don't need my flesh to be valuable. And I don't need it to feel good. I don't need a sense of value apart from God. And I know that's hard to trust. But when he meets you and he wraps his arms around you, he reveals himself to you. Then you wonder why you'd trust anything else. Thanks for being here today. Have a great afternoon. Go Browns.